This week, we interview Josh Piori from OpenDNS on honeypots and other such things. Security news this week includes Cisco routers getting pwned hard, what the NSA is really doing with zero-day exploits, and the fan favorite, WordPress insecurity. All that and more, so stay tuned. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, the show where exploits run wild. Packets aren't the only things getting sniffed. Systems aren't the only things getting penetrated. Functions are the only things getting wrapped. Bits aren't the only things getting banged. And the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. The SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security training, certification, and research. Visit SANS.org to explore the full curriculum and latest training offerings. Looking for a career change? Tenable Network Security is hiring. Everything from programmers to researchers. Check out all of the available positions at securityweekly.com forward slash tenable jobs. Pony Express. Check out their line of penetration testing devices, including the Pone Pad, the Pone Phone, and the Pone Pro. For enterprises, there's Pone Pulse, providing continuous visibility into wired, Wi Fi, and Bluetooth spectrums across all physical locations, including remote sites and branch offices. For all those hard to reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at PonyExpress.com. Welcome, everyone, to this edition of Security Weekly. I'm your host, Paul Astadorian, here in studio by myself. Jack and Larry couldn't make it this week. We're getting Michael Santarcangelo on via Skype, but everyone else seems to be MIA at the moment. So if you've seen the Security Weekly crew, please send us a tweet at Security Weekly so we can help us find the rest of the Security Weekly crew. So I'm flying solo for right now. We're going to get into an interview just after a a couple of very quick announcements. Purchase Hack Naked t-shirts and stickers online. That's shop.securityweekly.com for all your Hack Naked gear. I think we have three, maybe four pint glasses left with the Hack Naked logo. That's it on the pint glasses. The... The, the, no, we're sold out of pint glasses, I'm being told uh, by the production staff in my headset. Um, but <clears throat> you can order T-shirts, lady sizes, men's sizes, pink, red, you name it. Go to shop.securityweekly.com. Use the discount code HackNakedSummer and get 50% off your order. That's right. It's a summer blowout sale that ends on September 23rd, the first official day of fall. Tenable is also looking for a technical director. It's a somewhat of an evangelist role that uh, you can find a link in the show notes. It's a work from home job in the U.S. So make sure you check out the link in the show notes uh, for more information about that. And um, with no further ado, we have our fabulous guest interview for this evening. And Mr. Josh Piori is here with us. He is a security analyst with OpenDNS. Previously, he was a threat analyst at NSA, where he was part of the team to initially help build the Security Operations Center. He's also done some time at Mandiant. It makes it sound like you're like in jail or something, like he did time <laughs> at Mandiant. He's been in this information security business for 15 years. He's presented at DEF CON, multiple B-sides, as well as Source Boston. He will be speaking at DerbyCon, Source Seattle, and a bunch of other conferences. All of that stuff is in the show notes. So, Mr. Josh Piori, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. Actually, not NSA, NASA. <laughs> did I say NSA? You did. <laughs> you know, when we run the ad for B-Sides Tampa, they're going to Cozumel, Mexico, and I automatically say Cozumel, New Mexico. And there is no such place as Cozumel, New Mexico, unless there is, and I don't know my geography very well. But I did say NSA. I really meant NASA. I just left an A out of that. A lot of, a lot of people would attack NASA and try to deface things with... Uh, the words NSA on the websites. But. Yeah, I, well, and I said NSA in my introduction, so I just, it was in my brain. So I apologize. <laughs> Josh did not that work for the me. NSA. He did, in fact, work for NASA. Uh, so, Josh, thank you very much for coming on the show. How did you get your start in information security? I uh, started as, I feel like most people started uh, help desk support and then sysadmins. And then they realize all the bad things that are happening and they start, if they're interested, they, they go that route. So that's what I did. 
I wish more people would go that route. Yeah, a lot of people get into it with certifications. I think. Yeah, and it, but I think it's it's. I've said this on the show in the past. It's so important. I think to understand how things work, um, how things break normally before you start thinking about how to secure them and how to break them on purpose. Yeah, I think so. I agree. Um, so what did you do at NASA? Um, well, I started there initially. There wasn't, a, there wasn't a security operations center yet. All the centers were like their own, their own entities. Yes. And they decided to bring it all together. And they chose Ames Research Center, which is in Mountain View, which mm-hmm. uh, I live in the Bay Area, San Francisco area. So um, I applied. I found a job on Craigslist, actually. And I was like, this looks cool. I was a, I was a consultant, like an IT consultant, mm-hmm. um, not making enough money to really do anything. And uh, I applied to it. It turned out it, it was a, that job. And so I was one of the first uh, two analysts um, as they were building it. So I remember sitting, uh, sitting there with my laptop watching all of the network IDS traffic for all of NASA and I'm the only person on the job doing it. <laughs> wow. It sounds uh, similar to uh, people who work in a university setting. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a huge network full of university, military, uh, mm-hmm. flight stuff, and, and government. So. And it's very um, collegiate. Right, um, right. Yeah. So you have uh, cooperative partnerships with other organizations, as well as it sounded like before you started, things were very decentralized, which is often how universities are structured. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was a really fun adventure just being part of that system. So what was that like to take everyone who was decentralized and bring some of those security services centrally? What were some of the major challenges? Well, thankfully, I wasn't management for uh, until later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so I didn't have to deal with a lot of that stuff, but it was quite a hassle um, dealing with politics. Uh, I mean, especially politics of, of people who are really ingrained in the, in the government system, which is a slow bureaucratic system. Mm-hmm. Kind of a pain, but... Um, it, it all ended up working out. So. Cool. Yeah. Um, so you did time at Mandiant, which I said earlier <laughs> kind of sounds like you were like in jail or something. Uh, that, that's how it was written in your bio. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> so you, you worked at Mandiant. You don't have to talk about that if you don't want to. No, I don't mind. <laughs> uh, so what did you do at Mandiant? <laughs> I was just a, a, what they call a mirror analyst. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, mirrors their product that gets in the hosts and systems and networks and you can pull memory and pull stuff that's on the systems. Right. Okay. Um, they also have net, uh, network analysts that you're looking at uh, network sensors. So I would do that as well. But uh, I was hired to help help be a part of their um, their SOC because they built a, mm-hmm. a corporate client SOC uh, in Redwood City. So I, I was really excited. I was, I mean, they were a startup still, even though it's like six years in at that point for them. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, was, I was learning a whole bunch. It was much faster than government. And then, uh, uh, and the sock opened, and I got kind of put on night shift, and that's when I felt like I was doing time. <laughs> I, was, yeah. I, lasted, I lasted maybe two months, you know. Yeah, I, it's, it's I, interesting. Uh, there's a local company, Secure Works, here uh, that has an office in Rhode Island, uh, and there's a, a sock. And yeah, the the different shifts can be uh, it's pretty draining. After oh yeah. A while. Yeah, the first eight months I was there was um, was great. I worked from home basically, mm-hmm. and and the office in Virginia, I'd fly out there and work with awesome people. There's so many smart people there. Um, but then I left uh, a couple months before before they were acquired. I didn't know about that, and um, unfortunately, missed out on that um, those options. I mm-hmm. almost had them. <laughs> right. So but, how did so you work at OpenDNS? And you, you said you actually work for Andrew Hay, who appeared on the show about a month and a half yeah. ago. Um, so what, how did you get the job at uh, OpenDNS? That's funny. So I, I had gone back to NASA actually um, mm-hmm. right after Mandiant. Um, and uh, I was pretty content. I really enjoyed my work. And, um, but I was kind of looking at startups. I was in a, a motorcycle accident one day on one of my commutes, and I was mm-hmm. thinking, I need to stop doing this commute. It kind of sucks. It's a, it was like an hour each way. And um, I want to start up again. But I applied at a few. I got some offers for a few. I even had one signed letter somewhere. But I almost took it. And then I was just like, no, I'll just stay at NASA because I'd, like well, I'd like to work as open DNS. I had applied. Um, went through a whole process, and then I was denied because the job was taken away. And they just mm-hmm. canceled it. So then I was like, no, I don't want to give up. So I went to DEF CON. This is not this recent one, the one before. And I, I knew some of the researchers were talking about cool stuff. So I schmoozed with them and, and just hung out with them and, and um, did my best to just be there and 
I went to a few events at OpenDNS headquarters, and I just really wanted to work at this company because they're doing amazing stuff. So I um, I got another interview, and then I was hired, and I left NASA. So this, That's a very uh, – I like your strategy, Josh, for getting a job there. You're like, well, I basically you – know, I went to conferences, and if they had events, I went. Yeah, I basically tried to hang out with them and just mm-hmm. be myself, and then – you know, apply for another job there. That's really cool. I think that's some great uh, career advice for our listeners. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that way you get you get to know the people, and mm-hmm. you can really decide if you want to work there before you're actually uh, taking mm-hmm. the job off. Excellent, Mr. Michael Saint Archangelo has joined us. Welcome, Michael. How are you? Good. Excellent. Um, so, uh, Josh. Uh, so now, what exactly do you do at OpenDNS? Uh, so a lot. Uh, part of my job is reviewing. Um, when customers or prospective customers or someone complains to the customer service about a domain that's blocked or they can't get to a, a, a domain that's resolving to some IP address, um, mm. they want to know why. Or, or someone will recommend a, uh, a bunch of domains or something that needs to be blocked. And um, I'll, I'll research that stuff. And then in addition to that, uh, I, uh, I do security reports for prospective customers and existing customers. And then um, the fun part, the really fun part of my job, because that stuff is just, you know, just stuff you can do um, with sleeping, I feel like. But the fun part is that I get to do some research. I'm not a researcher. There are actually two different groups, but we all work together, right, sitting right next to each other. So I, I get to explore and try out new things mm-hmm. um, and build stuff, which is great. And uh, they encourage us to speak at conferences and um, to, to be uh, uh, advocates for security. That's really cool. Yeah, it's a great place. <clears throat> so you've, you've spent a lot of time going into security conferences. What are some of your uh, favorite security conferences and why? Well, I love DEF CON because of networking. Um, I don't like the line, line con. I don't like <laughs> elevator con. <laughs> I, I really just go there now to network. I barely even go to talks at all. Mm-hmm. I watch them later. Um, I, I've really been enjoying B-sides. I didn't really go to many of them until I started speaking at them. Um, and I'm really looking forward to DerbyCon. And uh, I've been to a few source conferences. So mm-hmm. I went to I pre- presented at Source Boston. It'll be at Seattle um, in a few weeks, I guess. And then, um, but DefCon is the best one because it's summertime in Vegas and there's swimming pools and alcohol and you know <laughs> all you that go. good stuff. Good, and good, a lot of great people. Yeah, good place to to network. Um, so now, what uh, what is your presentation? So did you, did you present at DefCon this year? No, no, I didn't. I submitted a completely different talk that I, I presented at a few other conferences. Okay, what was that talk? That was, what was it, uh, building a, a, a cloud intrusion detection s- uh, system to like watch over like the hosted websites. Oh, nice. So, yeah, it was fun. Yeah, I think, um, now, did, you, did that stem from some research that you've done at your day job at OpenDNS? No, actually, it's funny. We, uh, well... We're encouraged to speak, but um, we've never been given that thing. I don't represent my company or or yeah. that other those, those statements. We just kind of research things. So I was doing stuff that, I mean, I of course I see websites constantly hacked, mm-hmm. and I was like, well, there's got to be something, you know, easier that the average person can do instead of paying someone to do it. So I just thought I'd work on it. I built it, and it actually worked. So I talked about it. So it how, a, does, yeah, how do yeah how does that work? I mean. The conversations that I so I my day job is I work in product strategy, right, for Tenable Network Security. We're talking a lot about um, a lot of our conversations are centered around this movement to cloud, right? And it's interesting in RSA several years ago, everyone was like, "Oh my God, cloud, cloud, cloud!" And here we are five years later or more, and I'm like, "Well, everyone's going to be using the cloud, uh, whether it's an application that's provided to you or whether it's a platform that's provided to you." I feel like that we're just going to see this continue to see this mass migration to the cloud, and how does that impact security? And it seems like you've carved out a little uh, niche for yourself and an important issue, which is how do you secure your website in the cloud? Yeah, I was I was actually thinking of it as a, a business idea uh, a while ago, and it could still, could still totally work. You could still charge someone ten dollars a month to uh, have all their internet traffic go through an ADS. Yep, uh, it totally is a great idea. So. Um, but uh, I don't know. Yeah. It's uh, something to look at. I, I try to find things that I'm bothered by, like you know, mm. my work day, and 
thoughts and try to fix them. So There's a lot of smaller businesses, right, that use the cloud-based hosting providers. Um, a lot of them run a CMS because they're not web programmers, right? They're they're business people. They have a job to do, and they want to be able to go update a website. I feel like a lot of that technology has failed them. So what, is, what does the IDS do to, to help people in those situations? Um, I mean, just like you would if you had your own your control over your network and you put your web server inside your network uh, in a DMZ or something, you might have some intrusion detection, uh, which is not the best solution, but it's one of the solutions. <laughs> um, uh, to watch over a, a attacks against your website or any other servers you might have. It doesn't have to be a website. It could be anything. Um, but this was the idea that you could have your site hosted at HostGator and you could um, instead point your traffic, so make it so all traffic goes through this one place first and then goes over to HostGator. So you can see every attempt, every visit. It's just a, a more advanced um, log viewing thing, but using uh, uh, VRT and emerging threat rule sets mm -hmm. and your own. Nice. Very cool. Um, now, one of the things I noticed recently when I went to Black Hat was there were several vendors who said, well, you know, we've got this new technology. And they called it different things. And I can't remember the one term that kept coming about. But uh, after I said, well, what does it do? And after they described it, I was like, oh, you mean it's a honeypot, right? They're like, no, no, no. <laughs> it's this new thing. And I'm like, no, no, no. It's a honeypot. So what's your definition of, of honeypot? And then we'll talk about, I guess, how that applies to the technology today. Well, I love the title because it usually means an outhouse. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Google image search for honeypot. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's very interesting. You find a lot of uh, Winnie the Pooh. You also find a lot of uh, screen caps from an Archer episode, which I believe oh. was titled Honeypot, which is pretty funny. But that's probably tuned for my Google results, so that speaks a lot about <laughs> me. Well, to me, uh, I mean, a honeypot is, is a server or a system that you set up to look like a bunch of servers, so people will hopefully break into it and give you some intelligence. So that's my definition of it. And so what's the best way to use that intelligence today, Josh? So that... Um, Speaking at DerbyCon and a few other conferences um, about something I've been working on for about two months, um, uh, I'm calling it building a better honeypot network, which is really kind of crazy. I mean, there's a lot of smart people who build cool things, but um, I feel like the most common result of people deploying honeypots is some kind of threat map, like where you see attackers coming from China or wherever and attacking your little server, and I'm like, what's the point of that? I just, I just don't get... Mm. I mean, that's, it looks cool to management, but it doesn't give you anything useful. It doesn't give you IPs to research, malware to look at, or all that cool stuff. And all, there are honeypots that down, I mean, they store the malware, like, and you can go analyze it. Um, but you usually have to know what, know what you're doing. And right. uh, I was thinking it might be better to have a web interface, uh, which uh, provides all the results um, of people connecting in and what they're doing and gives you the access to the, what the malware is that they're downloading and what it's trying to do. And it, so how does that change people's, uh, the way you defend the network? I mean, do you hope to get intelligence that then changes your behavior? Yeah, I would hope so. Um, hopefully you get something where you can, uh, it's just another threat feed, but it's a more realistic one. It's like, um, I always wonder how, how do you become uh, the Brian Krebs of your organization? <laughs> right. Like how, do you, how do you get closer without learning Russian and infiltrating carding forums? Like. How do you, end up, or without becoming the malware author yourself, like you, you want you want to be as close to the attacks as possible so that you can um, stop them. Maybe you can add them to a sinkhole uh, domain that you see, or you can um, analyze malware and add domains to a sinkhole or IPs you can block in your network to protect your users. What percentage of the malware do you think is just sheer generic and just looking to build a button and do some generic attack? And what percentage do you think is really targeted at a specific industry? Um, when you know you set up a honeypot, right? You're going to see lots of attacks. Like, what percentage do you think are are geared towards either you or your industry, and what percentage is just totally generic? It depends on how you deploy the honeypot. I, I'm just guessing here, but I th would think the targeted stuff would you would see that a lot more. But still, you see it very little at at organizations where the attackers know they're attacking a specific organization. That I feel like most honeypots are going to have generic malware because it's people mm. or um, whoever or bots, maybe, I don't know, searching for um, 
the stuff that's available and trying to, to own it and probably just make use of it for fishing stuff. It's mostly commodity stuff, I think. Right, right. Yeah, that's my general sense. That's why I kind of get nervous about the um, how much a honeypot actually helps you if you're just out there kind of connect, uh, collecting generic attack data versus yeah. you know, what level. But if you could, Go ahead. if you work at, uh, I don't know, Lockheed Martin or something, it'd be awesome to set up a honeypot uh, inside your IP space and make it available and see what happens. Yeah, I would. I would hope that you'd get different stuff than just setting up a honeypot off of any other ISP um, and making it not really affiliated with an organization. I'd be, be curious to see the the differences, and I I think it depends on the industry and the organization as to like that how that percentage swings. Right, I would think Lockheed Martin would probably see a higher degree of targeted malware <laughs> than you know like your mom and pop like retail shop. Right. Yeah. Yeah. E- even. Um, working where I've worked, I've seen targeted malware, but it's not as much as you would think. Um, it was it was kind of rare. Most of the time, it was just commodity stuff or people just being stupid. Mm. Um, now, OpenDNS has uh, one of the solutions, right, is for smaller places to be able to have some level of filtering. Do you find a lot of people are taking advantage of that, or is there like a slower adoption? No, I, I think they're taking advantage of that. I mean, people find value in what um, what OpenDNS provides. Um, in terms of, of giving them an, a really strong extra layer of protection on, on all their devices. Mm-hmm. Hey, can we drill on that for a sec? Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Well, I mean, one of the things I like, so, so this is actually, I'm just curious if we, if we can expand on that. I think it's important to say people get value out of it. Do, do you have any, have you talked to people, can we give people better ideas on what type of value they've seen or how to quantify the value or how to better explain the value? Because I think that's an area where people listening to this could really benefit, especially if they know people running small businesses or even in their own organizations. So when somebody gets value out of it, what are some of the things that that they find that are valuable? And then if you don't quantify it, maybe how could we quantify it for people? See if I could answer. Hopefully this this is it. But I... I feel like I mean, there's a lot of information about what OpenDNS provides, um, but working with the researchers and seeing what we all do, um, there's some cool stuff that, that isn't, I mean, it's been in the news here and there or where there's like a, someone talks about it, but we have things like, um, uh, we are just sitting there with domains from other providers and blocking them and then protecting people against some attack or some malware that we saw three weeks ago. Um, we're doing uh, predictive intelligence, like uh, we're using natural language processing to find uh, domain names that might look like a legitimate domain name, so that when it's used for phishing, um, it's uh, it's automatically blocked, so people can't get to it. Like um, your PayPal.com actually might be real, but <laughs> um, there's a the, you know it looks for unusual names based off real names, and we also use um, algorithms. That's actually for- pretty cool. Yeah, it's amazing. There's actually Jeremiah. Um, O'Connor, is that his last name? Yeah, I'm blanking right now. He um he wrote this. It's called NLP Rank, and there's a he's been speaking at a few conferences, and there's actually an Ars Technica article about him uh, released last like February or something, and it talks all about it. It's great. And then we also do uh, machine learning uh, to find domains that are registered at certain points based off certain email addresses or certain actions, and also. Um, looking for uh, DGAs, uh, domain generated algorithms, and we hmm. automatically block those. And the the funnest part, or the funnest project I've been able to help with, my um, coworker Kevin Bottomley is the one who has done most of the work on this, but is to find uh, crypto wall and crypto related ransomware stuff uh, domains before they're even uh, becoming a thing, because they spike up for a little while and then they kind of die out, like compromised domains by Angler or something. And he uh, he's created this process, which I've been able to help on, that find, finds the domains, blocks them before we really see anything. So we occasionally get a, crypt, a customer infected with crypto wall or something, but we used to get five a week before this started, and now we get one maybe every every month or so. It's, it's pretty awesome. Um, speaking to someone who uh, we've run into a lot of occurrences where uh, legitimate sites get taken down. We had an incident over the past weekend where YouTube's auto-generating algorithm uh, had flagged our YouTube channel as spam. What is your kind of level of false positive rate, and uh, how do you deal with that? Uh, I don't know the actual percentage, but it's I've heard people say lower than two percent. Mm-hmm. So, um, 
we just deal with it by um, you know we don't I don't spend all day dealing with customer support issues um, that are routed to me um, when they need to go to the security team because there isn't that much. It's um, mm-hmm. it's a pretty good system. I'm I'm really amazed at how how little of a false positive rate it is. It's it's less than it was um, dealing with the same kind of activities um, at previous organizations. Yeah, and I can see with the domain system. It must be pretty easy to tell when something nefarious is going on versus some legitimate person registering a domain, correct? Yeah, in some cases. Uh, not in all the <laughs> cases where, where you have a, a domain that's compromised because it's WordPress is crappy or something. Uh, yes, um, yes. Yeah, my fishing content's buried somewhere. How would you even say that? WordPress is bulletproof. We didn't never <laughs> even talk about it. Can, can I go back for a second, though? Because sure. what I'm, 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 and again, this more just interest. One of the things I think is important. Uh, I mean, first of all, I, I love the stuff that you laid out, especially for small businesses. But so how about confidence? I mean, how much – so if somebody is a small business and it, they start using some of these services, I mean, is it a you're, you're good, don't worry, or we get most of it? Like how would you position that from a confidence perspective? So I would say I, – I don't think you should ever say you're good, don't worry. But, yeah, I um, agree. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like the test case, right? Okay, you passed. Good job. <laughs> but I think um, uh, I think it's um, like the crypto wall example. Sometimes you know we catch we catch the domains before we actually have ways to see the spikes, like actual graphic of a spike um, or traffic spiking up through open DNS infrastructure. But we we sometimes we catch it. There's already been a little bit of an uptick on that traffic to that domain, and. Um, Sometimes it's a patient zero, which is why we occasionally see a uh, crypto wall infection with a customer who's actually using a service like the full, full enterprise suite of our stuff. They, they happen to get a domain we didn't block, but we blocked it like maybe an hour after they, after they got to it, but we didn't even know they got to mm-hmm. it yet. So I'd say you're pretty good. Um, you're mostly good. <laughs> and and it's the, the best part is, um, I mean, uh, uh, the way it's designed is so that it protects devices when they're outside of your perimeter. Oh, that is nice. Yeah. Actually. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. It depends on what you're using. If you have the free service, you're just getting, I believe you're just getting content filtering. But if you're paying for the, there's like a, there's a thing called the umbrella roaming client, which is like a, you can install on phones and laptops. And that way, if you go to the cafe, you're still going through uh, the protection. Are you guys are are you focused on enterprise or are you more in that SMB mid market range with these types of tools? Can um, anybody benefit from them? Let me ask yeah, you. Yeah, anyone, anyone can benefit from them. I, I've seen that we have customers that are go from very small. We have managed service providers to um, humongous ones, like really really large corporations, which I, I don't think I'm supposed to say. But no, no, no names that we names that you would recognize. <laughs> All right, do the rhymes with. Tell us what it rhymes with. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm terrible at rhyming. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had I had a question there. Oh, so uh, I've seen a lot of like schools and other organizations, um, Josh, use your services to help protect you know their students from the bad things on the internet, such as pornography. How do you go about categorizing all the porn sites? Well, that's uh, that's my lucky coworker Vinny's job. <laughs> <laughs> that's so awesome. he's he's the main person who does categorization. He's been there for I think six years now, a long time. In well, yeah, of, I mean, his job I would think is to just surf porn all day and go, "Yup, that's porn," and then go yeah, add it into the database, right? And that's <laughs> Vinny. It's the Vinny algorithm. Yeah, yeah, it's great. He's actually really great. He does um, does a good job. He's categorized all sorts of things, and then there's a, a there's a community. Um, I don't I don't really get to deal with it too much. Uh, I'm usually dealing with other stuff. So, but there's a whole community of people who submit things, and I believe that that people can categorize things themselves as well inside their own environment. I see. So a lot of it is crowdsourced, correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's it's, cool. It's a lot like Fish Tank. Fish Tank is crowdsourced um, phishing uh, a notification, which mm-hmm. goes into our our feeds of, of block stuff. Excellent. Yeah. Um, was there anything else you wanted to talk about, Josh, in terms of uh, presentations you're giving or open DNS technology? Uh, I, uh, I don't know. <laughs> now, so your your talk at DerbyCon, which one is that? That's building a honey, a better honeypot network. I'm, I'm okay. done with the cloud one because uh, four times <laughs> Cla- enough. Cloud is so 2013. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was like yeah, it's a ways better. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's cool. 
Uh, no, I'm doing Mike, that actually there, and I got accepted at um, DeepSec in Vienna, which I'm really excited about. The November. same talk? Same talk. I'm doing it um, there in B-Sides LA and Seattle, and then I'll probably stop that because I, I don't want to um, – I mean, you've got to move on to something else. Otherwise, I'm, I'm learning. I'm learning with Python, and I'm learning Flask and some other things. So this project, it may not be as good as some people have done, but it's taken me two months of just constant working on it. I'm still working on it to this moment. I'll, I'll be making my slides on the airplane or in the hotel room. So <laughs> Those are we'll usually some of the best talks. I hope actually. so. <laughs> We um, uh, Nick is writing a project in Flask for us as well, so I'm I'm happy when I hear other people using it as well, so That's we can cool. lean on each other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mike, did you have any more questions for Josh? Well, you know, I I did see um, if we can go here in, in the questions that you had in the wi in the wiki. Mm. You cite the recent article, and then uh, which providers had the most phishing data? Oh, yeah. That's a kind of fascinating to me, actually. So I, I didn't, I didn't get a chance to look at the article in depth yet. But Paul, can we talk about that for a couple minutes? Sure, go ahead. Uh, well, so that was actually a really fun article to do. I, I mean, this job's great because I get to explore, and we we had that data from Fish Tank. Um, it's uh, I forget how many. There's two two million submissions maybe since it started. So, so it's, it's small. Couple, it's small. <laughs> there could be twenty million. I might be off. <laughs> but Just whatever. kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I took it. You can download a CSV of every everything. So I did some Pythoning, Python magic, I guess. And I I ran some st statistics on these domains, found the ASNs that they go with, and um, and just kept, uh, mapped it to the organizations that own those to show which uh, which out of fish tank data um, had the most content. It's like you know, GoDaddy. GoDaddy is a really big one. I hope you guys are sponsored by them because. <laughs> Or if you are, maybe they can um, clean up some of those sites. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of other site, uh, other um, organizations. There's three or four that have hundreds of thousands that we've seen of phishing content, so they're, they're getting compromised a lot, or shadow domain shadowing, or something like that. So I, I got to write about that and draw some pretty pictures. What was your biggest surprise going into it? Uh, I mean, did, did you have a premise? Or a hypothesis when you went into it? That, was there something you kind of expected uh, that either you confirmed or did, was there, what was a surprise? Something you, you didn't anticipate that kind of sticks with you? I, let's see. I sort of, I, I don't know if I had any big surprises. I, I had, um, it's just that there were about two or three, maybe four. It's on the blog post, but, um, and the graph I did, but that, that really stood out. They they were like ninety percent above everyone else, and all these other really well known providers had very little phishing content according to fish tank data. So that was that was surprising. I thought it'd be kind of level across the board. So I don't know what that says about those organizations. But is it because I'm looking at the names? I mean, is it just possible that they're just the biggest, and therefore that's the easiest target? Right? It's just a it's just a volume issue. Might be the the most the one that had the most, which um, I can't remember the name. Cyrus one, I think. Cyrus so. one. Yep. Yeah, they um, uh, GoDaddy uses quite a bit of their infrastructure, so it could still be GoDaddy. Uh, GoDaddy was second, I think. Right. So, yeah. yeah, it was interesting. I'd love to be able to see all the phishing uh, things, all the compromised websites in the world, and run some stuff up against that. That'd be great. Well, yeah, I mean, what I like about this, too, is it's, it's, it's more data because phishing is one of those things that we see it more and more coming up as being important. And so far, we're kind of like, yeah, it's bad. Yep. <laughs> and, and so at least having some data, starting to look at stuff, I, I'm kind of, I'd like, you know, I'll, I'll follow up afterwards. I'd like to learn more about some ways to start to use technology to say, oh, you clicked on a link, but that was kind of bad. Like, we're going to just tamp it down for you because that's, that's. Yeah. That's great. I like that. Yeah. That's awesome. That's really cool. Josh, are you ready to play five questions with Security yeah. Weekly? Oh, yeah, I am. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> no one's... I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm really excited, though. Oh, that's good. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, three words to describe yourself. Um, calm, sleepy, and hungry. <laughs> if you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Oh, jeez. So many to choose from. <laughs> uh, 
skydiving suit. <laughs> if you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Oh, crap. <laughs> you guys need a timer. Um, That's actually my answer is, oh, crap. <laughs> That's, uh, I'm going to go with that. That's a good oh, answer. Crap. That's a good answer. <laughs> Explanation. In, in the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? I think I'll go second because that way I've, uh, I'm already a little bit turned on. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, Josh, choose two celebrities to be your parents. Alive or dead? David Bowie and Grace Jones. Nice, nice. Yeah. This is where it, the it, like, during the break we cue the David Bowie music. It'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so producers can get on that well Josh thank you very much for appearing on Security Weekly you can find more links to all of Josh's stuff including his Twitter um, the OpenDNS blog and more by going to our show notes wiki.securityweekly.com Josh thank you again for appearing on Security Weekly yeah thank you for having me it's great yes. tell Andrew we said hello I will of course <clears throat> and with that we're going to take a short break come back and talk about the stories for this week so stay tuned don't go anywhere <laughs> 